I guess this talk will go in a different direction from all the ones we've heard so far, so please bear with me. Uh, I'll talk about numerical relativity simulations and how we can accurately model them using data-driven approaches. So in particular, I'll talk about binary black holes, which are two black holes that are orbiting each other, and they're also the most abundant sources uh, for gravitational wave detectors such as LIGO and Virgo. However, to understand the signals that are seen by these detectors, we need a very accurate model that can predict the gravitational waves coming from these sources. So for given any binary black hole, so we'll have two masses, which I'm representing here, and we'll also have two spins, which are represented by these arrows. So the spin is just how fast the black hole is rotating, so it's a three-dimensional vector. So overall, we'll have eight dimensions, two masses and two, uh, two spin vectors. Each of them is a three vector. So it's a very high-dimensional problem. Uh, luckily, the total mass scales out in GR, so we only care about the ratio of the two masses when we're modeling it, so it's a seven-dimensional problem. But it's still very high-dimensional and a very complex uh, problem. In, and apart from the dimensions, the gravitational waveform is also a complex uh, waveform. I'll show more complex ones uh, later on. But to start with, when the two black holes are far away from each other, they're orbiting each other and losing energy to gravitational waves, so they get closer and closer, and they also start orbiting faster. So you'll see that the amplitude of the gravitational wave increases, and the frequency also increases. And this continues until they finally merge into a single black hole, and that's the merger part of the signal. And then what you have is a highly distorted single black hole. And then all of these distortions are quickly radiated away in the final part of the signal, which is called the ring down. And what you have left finally is a Kerr black hole, a single Kerr black hole. So we want to model all these three stages. And to model the initial part, uh, where the black holes are still far away from each other, we could use approximate analytical methods such as post-Newtonian theory. Similarly, at late times, we can use black hole perturbation theory to predict the gravitational wave signal. But as the black holes approach the merger, the space-time is highly dynamical, and the black holes are moving at about half the speed of light. So all of these analytical methods break down, and we have only one option, which is to solve the Einstein's equations numerically, and that's where numerical relativity comes in. However, there's one big problem with numerical relativity in that it's very expensive. So a single simulation for this whole process can take about a month on a supercomputer. So you can't use it for direct data analysis applications. You need a much faster method. So people have developed some approximate waveform models which extend the validity of post-Newtonian theory to later times. And this is done by adding some correction terms and then fitting any free parameters to numerical relativity simulations. But the problem with that is you have to make a choice for what kind of corrections you're doing, going to do. So you're adding assumptions that are not necessarily there in the simulations. And also these models tend to not capture the full complexities of the numerical relativity simulations. So you can ask the question, is there a way to achieve the accuracy of the numerical relativity simulation without adding any ad additional assumptions while still being very fast to evaluate? So that's where surrogate modeling comes in. The idea is you take a bunch of numerical relativity simulations and you interpolate between all of them and build a fast approximate. So uh, before I go into the particulars of the model that we built, I'll give a very uh, simple example of how this works. So I'll, I'll take a one-dimensional example where both black holes are non-spinning. So the only free parameter now is the ratio of the two masses, which is Q. So it's the ratio of the larger black hole's mass by the smaller black hole mass. Uh, that's on this axis here, and on this axis is the time. So in order to build a surrogate model of your data, you start with a data set of waveforms, which, for example, can be all of your waveforms, all of your numerical relativity waveforms in that parameter space. And the first thing you want to do is build an accurate basis that, that is made up of only a small set of uh, waveforms. In fact, we use the same waveforms that we are trying to model to build our basis. So let's say this is what our waveforms look like. And the waveforms that I'm showing here, let's say these are the most representative waveforms that I picked out from my data set. And I picked them out such that the projection errors for all the points in my data set onto the basis are below some threshold. So by doing that, I'm basically reducing my data set into those small set of waveforms. In fact, rather than work with the waveform itself, which you can see is highly oscillatory, we could work with slowly varying functions of time. So here I'll use the amplitude and phase of the waveform. Here, for example, the amplitude is shown on the top. It's a very slowly varying function of time, which makes it easier to model. 
So at this stage, uh, let's say these are the four basis functions we picked out to represent our data set. So we have reduced this whole parameter space into just those four basis functions. We can do the same in the time direction, which is done with the method called empirical interpolation, which once again picks out the most representative time values and builds an interpolant in time using just those few time values. And at this point now, we've also reduced our data in the time direction to just a small set of values. So now what we have is a set of basis functions. So let that be these E of I, uh, EI uh, basis functions. Uh, but to evaluate the amplitude at some generic mass ratio where we don't have data, what we need along with the basis is the coefficients that we need to multiply the basis. We can compute the coefficients for each of these cases just by inverting this equation and using the orthonormality of the basis, but we don't know the value of the coefficient at, let's say, this intermediate point. So we want to build fits across parameter space for each of those coefficients. However, however one of the advantages of the empirical interpolation that I just talked about is that you can translate the value of the coefficients into the value of the amplitude at, the, at these different times. So what all we need to do now is fit across the parameter space at each of those times for the amplitude at those times. And finally, so now uh, let's say we want to get the waveform or the amplitude of the waveform at this point, and we don't already have data there, so it's a new prediction. Um, as I said, you can translate the amplitude at those points into the coefficients. So first we evaluate the amplitude at each of those times. That gives us this, and then that gives us the coefficients. Now we have the basis functions, which we get in the first step. We also have the basis coefficients. All we do is now sum it up, and it's a very cheap evaluation step. And we get the waveform at our intermediate point, where we didn't previously have data. And the fact that we use the basis from numerical relativity simulations to tell, inform us about the phenomenology of the waveform means that we're, as long as our basis projection errors are below some level and our fit errors are below some level, we are able to reproduce the numerical relativity simulation at, a, at an error level that is comparable to the simulations themselves. Okay, so we applied this method to a, what I showed now was a one-dimensional example, but we applied it to a much more complex problem of precessing binary black holes. So to explain what that is, let me show some movies. Uh, so on the, in these movies, the black holes are represented by these markers. The size of the marker tells you the radius of the black hole, and the arrows indicate the spins of the black holes. And the arrow in the center is the orbital angular momentum, so it's always perpendicular to the plane of the orbit, so it tells you the orientation of the orbit. The wave here is the plus polarization of the gravitational wave as seen by an observer at infinity. And this patches here also represents the plus polarization, but as seen by an observer at that point in the plane. So whenever the patch is red, it means that the space-time is being stretched. And whenever it's blue, it means that it's being squished. OK, so uh, the main difference you should notice between these two cases is that in this case, the two spins of the black hole are always either along the orbital angular momentum direction or opposite to that. Therefore, these are called aligned spin binary black holes. While on the other hand, these spins are randomly or generically orient oriented, and they can have a tilt with respect to the orbital angular momentum direction. And this is important, and you'll see the difference as I start the movie. On the left, uh, the plane of the orbit is always going to be fixed in the horizontal direction, while on the right, the spins interact with the orbit as well as with each other, and this causes the plane of the orbit to precess as the binary evolves. So that's why it's called a precessing binary black hole. And this precession is particularly important because it has a direct imprint on the gravitational waveform, and it has all of these modulations because of this precession. So we can look for these effects of the waveform in the gravitational wave data that we see, and that informs us about the spins of the black hole, which in turn can tell us a lot about the astrophysics uh, that we see, uh, that we can explore. So precession is a very important quantity to model. However, uh, now because precession uh, involves the two spins of the black holes and they're generically oriented, it's a very high dimensional problem. So you have two spins, each of which is a vector, so that's six dimensions, and you have the mass ratio which we saw before. That's a total of seven dimensions. So we use 1,500 numerical relativity simulations, each of which took a month on a supercomputer, and then we build an interpolant between all of those. 
So here is a corner plot of all the simulations. So each, uh, each uh, dimension here is represented, but it's getting cut off. Okay. So this is the mass ratio, and these are the different spins. So I won't go into the details. This is for any experts in the audience. And, but if you want to look at the details, you can go to our paper. Uh, I just wanted to show that this is a very high dimensional problem. And the difference between the demo I showed before and the, and the problem now, one of the main differences is that rather than doing a one dimensional fit like I showed before, now we are doing a seven dimensional fit, uh, which we do using different methods, including Gaussian process regression. Uh, but all of those details can be found in the paper. So rather than going to the details, I'll skip to the results. Um, so here is an example of how well this model performs. On the top case is the worst performance of our model when compared against all of these 1,500 simulations. So the black line here is the numerical relativity simulation, and the red dashed line is our surrogate model for the simulations. As you can see, even for the worst case, it's it tracks the numerical relativity simulation reasonably closely, and it also captures all of these modulations due to precession. And you can compare that with an existing model, a different waveform model called SEOB NRV3, which uses the approximate methods that I talked about. Uh, so, and then that has a much uh, more significant deviation from the numerical relativity simulation. And then the bottom plot now is the worst case for the other model, where it's significantly different, while in that case, the surrogate turns out to, turns out to perform very well. So the point of this plot is just a visual, uh, visual example of how well the model performs. But we can actually quantify that uh, with something called the mismatch, uh, which you can just think of as, as an inner product between two waveforms. Um, okay. uh, the lower the mismatch is, the closer two waveforms are to each other. So here, uh, the red histogram is the error for our model when compared against numerical relativity simulations. And the black histogram is the inherent error in the simulations themselves. We, we perform the simulations at multiple resolutions, and then we estimate the error by, by comparing the two highest resolutions. So that's what this error is. And you should notice that the surrogate errors are at the same level as the numerical relativity resolution errors. So which means that we are kind of doing as well as we possibly can, and we are basically limited by the resolution of the simulations. And that also means that our model basically rivals the numerical relativity simulations themselves in reproducing new simulations. And then you can compare that with the errors for the other model that I talked about, which is between one and two orders of magnitude worse. And this is also what we saw in the previous plot. OK, uh, so let me quickly summarize. Uh, numerical relativity simulations are very expensive. So surrogate models comes to the rescue. And you can, using this, you can cheaply reproduce numerical, re re numerical relativity simulations without a loss of accuracy. Um, so, I've, so I've shown a few movies like this before. What I didn't mention is that this entire movie is, is built using only surrogate models without direct numerical relativity simulations. So in this example, for, uh, for instance, is something called the super kick, where uh, close to the merger, you'll notice that the two black hole spins are roughly in the same plane, but facing opposite directions. So that's a specific configuration called the super kick configuration. I think you'll see that any second now. OK, roughly there. Um, and then after the merger, uh, the black hole, the final black hole, receives a recoil. And now I'll speed up the movie so that you can see that. And there it goes. It just flies away. The final velocity is about 100 the speed of light. So that means that this black hole would have been kicked out of any of the even the most uh, massive elliptic galaxies. So this tells us something about the retention rate of binary black holes. And like I said, this is made entirely using surrogate models. Before now, if you wanted to do a, a visualization like this, you would have had to get a supercomputer, done a numerical relativity simulation for a month, and then rendered the data. But now you can do this in five seconds on your laptop, because we made a pip installable Python package, uh, which you can install by going to this website. Uh, but also, apparently, nowadays, cameras can just get uh, QR codes without the need for an app. So if you can point your camera at that, that will take you to that website as well. Uh, and we also explore a lot of interesting physics using our visualizations, so do check it out, and thank you. <laughs>